European Union agrees to reopen its borders to 15 countries, excluding the virus-stricken United States. A huge fire has ravaged a refinery in Kuwait, but no injuries have so far been reported. And Air France aims to cut over 6,500 jobs over the next two years. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South and I'm Camila Escalante. The European Union has agreed to reopen its borders to 15 countries, excluding the virus-stricken United States as the pandemic accelerated globally with more than 500,000 deaths worldwide. After days of negotiations, EU members finalized the list of countries whose health situation was deemed safe enough to allow residents to enter the bloc beginning on July the 1st. But the U.S. was notably excluded along with Russia and Turkey. Those on the list are Algeria, Australia, Canada, Japan, Georgia, Montenegro, Morocco, New Zealand, Rwanda, Serbia, South Korea, Thailand, Tunisia, and Uruguay. Now on to the Caribbean where our correspondent Laura Palmeiro has the latest updates on the region's most important stories. Thanks for the contact. These are the most recent stories and news from Caribbean countries. And let's start with Dominican Republic, where the government informed that the Electoral Board is ready for the parliamentary and presidential elections on July 5. In the Dominican Republic, when there is only one week for elections, the tax schedule for the moment has been done on time. The documentation was dispatched to the northeastern region, specifically Duarte and Hermanas Mirabal provinces, and the distribution started in Bonao and La Vega municipalities, while the process will begin immediately in the northwestern and southern provinces. Also in Dominican Republic, the National Meteorological Office informed that the Sahara dust will continue affecting Caribbean countries this week. Dust particles from the Sahara persist over the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic, and although they remain less intense on the island, the forecasts of the National Meteorological Office are that by next weekend it will intensify again in the area. It was reported by the Meteorological Office that the recommendations for the general population to use protective masks, especially people with respiratory problems and allergies, will be maintained. The phenomenon is expected to reach some development in the next 48 hours. It is recommended to drink a lot of liquids due to the high temperatures. 110 days after the first three positive cases of COVID-19 were detected in Cuba yesterday, June 29, the figures continue to be encouraging and testify to the work done to contain the pandemic. With eight new patients, 10 medical discharges and no deaths the previous day, the positive trend continues in the island. The government of Granada announced the reopening of the Maurice Bishop Airport on July 1st after three months of having closure due to COVID-19 pandemic. According to Tourism Minister Clarice Modest, the country is ready to receive international and regional travelers aware of the risk and finding out people infected by SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus around the world. The Granada minister stated that all passengers entering the island will be checked and quarantined, some with more restrictions than others. Granada registered 23 COVID-19 cases with no deaths, and it's currently one of the 10 nations in the Caribbean community without active cases of the pandemic. And these are the most recent stories for Caribbean countries. Thanks for the contact. Let's go back to you in the studio. Now on to Venezuela, where leaders of political organizations met with new rectors of the electoral authority to advance towards the parliamentary elections, which will be held in December. We have more in this report. Venezuela's political organizations were called by the National Electoral Council to present its proposals and participate in the discussion over the regulatory framework for the parliamentary elections of this year, following the ruling of the Supreme Court of Justice to carry out the electoral process in accordance with the Constitution. Your participation contributes to the robustness of the electoral system, which will translate into a greater vitality of our democracy with the possibility of settling our differences in peace. 
The objective is for the people to observe us, audit us, and have the confidence that we are working together to strengthen peace. Political parties were glad to be a part of this initial process alongside the new electoral authorities. This is a meeting between the electoral arbitrators and the political entities which participate in the process because that helps the transparency and reliability of the process in a way that is fundamental to us, which is the wide participation of Venezuelans. The opposition is debating on whether or not to participate. Sectors which opt for a more violent path of foreign intervention against the country, led by Juan Guaido, have said that they will abstain from the process. However, there are others who are looking to participate. I also participated in the call to abstain from the previous process, and we must say that this doesn't leave anything for the country nor for the sectors of the opposition, because every time we abstain, those are lost spaces, and the leaders of the opposition know it. The problems of Venezuelans must be solved by Venezuelans. Among the points discussed is the promotion of wide popular participation, ensuring the principle of representation of the different sectors of the country, both nationally and regionally. We support any decision or mechanism that the CNE determines to promote credibility, diversity and faithful implementation of the decision of the sovereign, the people, and with a plural election with diversity in which they will have the participation with greater and lesser force. They will have the possibility of joining the National Assembly. The new rectors will enter into permanent session and have said that they will continue to work with all political sectors. During the awarding of the 2020 Simon Bolivar National Journalism Prize, President Nicolas Maduro announced that his government will take diplomatic action following revelations regarding the use of the Spanish embassy in Caracas to plan the terrorist incursion of May the 3rd with the complicity of the Spanish ambassador. Venezuela se reserva. Venezuela reserves the right to take diplomatic actions against the ambassador of Spain for his participation in the armed incursion in Makoto and his complicity with the criminal acts reported in the Wall Street Journal by Mr. Leopoldo López. More information will be provided in the coming hours. And the Venezuelan president also condemned a European Union resolution which imposes new sanctions against the country. The European Union today issued a resolution where the supremacist European Union applies new sanctions to those Venezuelans who, as part of our state institutions, defend the Constitution, and sanctions the Board of Directors of the Opposition National Assembly because that Board of Directors has refused to follow the orders of the European Union Embassy in Caracas. And President Maduro also announced the expulsion of the European Union's envoy to Venezuela in response to the new sanctions. Enough is enough. That's why I have decided to give the ambassador of the European Union in Caracas 72 hours to leave our country. And I demand respect from the European Union. Enough European colonialism against Venezuela. Stop the persecution against Venezuela. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. In Bolivia, the Supreme Electoral Court announced the activation of the machinery of the electoral process for the September 6th election. We have details in this report. The electoral process has been retaken after more than two months of suspension due to the coronavirus pandemic. Its continuation now in progress takes into account security measures for voters and electoral authorities. We are adopting all precautionary measures for public health not only on election day, but also in the handling of the electoral material from when it is received in the court to when it is distributed to the departmental courts until it arrives in the premises. We have specific measures that will be adopted for the training of jurors and also for election day. A legislative initiative is in progress so that the state finances for candidates in the race can be put towards the health and safety measures found. International accompaniment of the process is also being guaranteed. 
the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the Association of Electoral Bodies of Latin America and other organizations have shown their interest. All of these organizations have ratified their will to accompany the Bolivian electoral process to be present. Another decision has been to guarantee voting in the 32 countries where suffrage has been enabled, all while the de facto government continues to warn against the growth of coronavirus cases in an attempt to try to influence yet another delay for the vote. The Bolivian population ought to know that we are entering a stage of rapid rise of COVID cases, and this requires us to take measures that will help us to reduce the impact where possible. The movement towards socialism, which remains the favorite according to voter intention surveys, has said that there are several experiences of voting during the pandemic that, apart from being a reality, is something which will be necessary to adapt to. There will also be municipal elections in several Latin American countries. So there are going to be elections. It should not be a problem. And in addition, not only elections, but with any activity, Bolivians need to be adapting to this period of coronavirus. Eight candidates are in the race for the September elections. Seven represent the right-wing sectors which failed their promise to put forth one single candidate to confront the movement towards socialism. Communities of Afro-Uruguayans demonstrated against racism. Protesters took to the streets in the capital, Montevideo, with drums and played the traditional African-derived candombe rhythm. They denounced racism against them and the killing of George Floyd by police in the United States. Women and members of the LGBT community also joined this protest. The community held up Black Lives Matter signs and demanded justice for black people killed in Uruguay and around the world. There's no doubt that we of African descent have the drums ingrained as something very much of our own. But today, they are a pillar of popular culture. So we found that it was the best way to give an expression to this movement. It is a social manifestation not only in the United States, but everyone should know that in Uruguay there are also people of African descent and that there are also racial problems that are not visualized. According to official data, close to 100,000 people live in what are called poverty camps in Chile in the midst of a health crisis that has also brought on massive layoffs. More details in this report. The word camp is usually associated with vacations and adventures, but in Chile it means poverty, but not even the poor are called poor. They are now vulnerable. So this is a vulnerable camp and even more so with the COVID-19 pandemic and the winter. Violeta Parra is a takeover of land that begins on September 1st, 2019. Clearly people in here cannot ask for a loan to buy a house, and even more at this time of pandemic. They can't even afford rent. So this was the only solution we had, to raise awareness of our necessities. With most households without a source of income, they need solidarity and help from abroad. We were working on building a library for kids. This was our main challenge, then we were hit by the pandemic, and we had to act quickly to resolve our urgent needs, which was helping people. And with a lack of employment, we tried to help them overcome basic necessities, food and clothes. There are some organizations that are helping us. They tell us that they will bring food on a given day, so we count on that. And we don't have to worry for another day now. Singer and songwriter Violeta Parra would speak of the needs of the people which are reflected here in the corners and the mud. For example, this man makes fences, another man works on building his home, and these women cook lasagna for everyone. One of the neighbors shares her home and her kitchen. We need them, and she is kind to let us have it. We go to the fair and we ask for things we need. 
Sometimes people bring us little things, and with that we survive day by day. Sometimes we ask the collaboration, some coins, so we can buy meat, chicken, and what we might need. I came to this land takeover on September 16th with my three kids. Now, unfortunately, I lost one of my kids. He was run over by a car during the entrance of the takeover. He was four years old. I fought for them so I can have my own home, and I will continue fighting. I will fight until the last minute. We have gone through hard times. We lived in tents. We were cold. And now we're more organized, but we still have necessities, we still have needs. All of us here will keep fighting for the same thing, for a dignified home and our lives, as well as for our children's lives. Close to half of the populations are immigrants, mainly from Colombia and Haiti. We had many needs, and we were bad economically. So this was the option we had so that we can live in peace. We are approximately 600 families here in seven committees. We have a lot of foreigners living in the same conditions on the land. We saw the foreigners were living in overcrowded places, and there is still a lot of racism in Chile, and people take advantage of the foreigners. These populations were called Cayampa. They would appear from night to the morning. The social housing projects have somehow alleviated the problems but have created another one, a social ghetto and overcrowding. Now more than 100,000 people live like that, and the number is growing with the crisis created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are fighting for all Violeta Parra, so we can all have our homes soon, so we can live and have a strong fight, to fight hard and to be healthy. Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Santiago de Chile. Sudanese protesters have returned to the streets to pressure transitional authorities demanding justice for those killed in the uprising last year, which led to the military's ouster of longtime autocrat Omar al-Bashir. The Million Man March was called by the Sudanese Professionals Association and the so-called resistance committees, which were incremental in the protests against al-Bashir and the generals who took over power for months following his removal. Security forces closed off major roads and streets leading to government and military headquarters in the capital Khartoum ahead of the protests. Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok on Monday promised his transitional government would work to carry out the protesters' demands in the next two weeks. A huge fire west of Kuwait's Mina Abdullah refinery has been extinguished by firefighters and there were no injuries. The fire broke out on Monday evening and destroyed more than 3,000 new cars, miscellaneous goods, dyes, and wood. Local authorities deployed firefighters of nine fire stations to tackle the huge fire, which broke out in a warehouse and engulfed es an estimated uh, 125,000 square meters. We'll take a short break now. You can join us again after this. Welcome back. French police have found no suspicious activity in Paris's La Defense business district after concerns about a possible armed man in the area proving unfounded. Earlier in the day, the police said on Twitter that a shopping center in La Defense was being evacuated to allow for checks after someone reported seeing a man carrying a gun. The shopping center, metro station, and offices in the surrounding area have now been reopened. Shoppers and workers will also now be able to move freely around the district again. Air France aims to present a plan to trade unions to cut just over 6,500 jobs over the next two years, on top of the 6,500 staff cuts, roughly representing just under 15% of employees, such as pilots, ground staff and flight attendants. An additional 1,000 layoffs would be made at Air France's top airline. Now saddled with 10.4 billion euros in government bailout debt to cope with the pandemic, France's flagship airline, part of the Air France KLM group, must now step up restructuring to stay competitive and independent. 
Philippine rescuers have said that there are no signs of survivors from a fishing vessel which sunk on Sunday after colliding with a cargo ship in waters southwest of Manila. Philippine authorities deployed aircraft and ships in the hunt for the missing people of the fishing vessel, including 12 Filipino crew members and two passengers. Meanwhile, the captain of the cargo ship, Vienna Wood, which is registered in Hong Kong, called for help a few hours later, and the vessel was being escorted to land by the Philippine Coast Guard. In Russia, the government has vehemently denied allegations made by the New York Times of the Kremlin's alleged relationship with Taliban groups in Afghanistan. From Moscow, our correspondent Lysandra Andres has more. A Kremlin spokesman has called these allegations lies after the New York Times claimed there is a relationship between Russia and the Taliban groups in Afghanistan. Last week, the newspaper quoted anonymous U.S. intelligence agencies saying that the Russian military intelligence had offered rewards to Taliban-related soldiers for carrying out attacks against U.S. soldiers. But these sources did not provide any kind of evidence. Following the publication of this article, the Russian embassy in the United States announced that threats had been issued against these diplomats. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs also called the claims made in this publication false, and the White House also criticized this article, pointing out that its own intelligence services have not reported any of this to President Donald Trump. Meanwhile, President Trump also said that this publication was commissioned by certain interests and that no report had reached him or the vice president about it. Finally, the U.S. Foreign Ministry has said that the publication of this article and the ongoing misinformation campaigns against Russia are evidence of the differences between U.S. political parties. California continues to record a new spike in COVID-19 cases, raising their total to over 100,000 as the pandemic continues to spread unabated across the United States. Los Angeles and neighboring counties have been hardly hit despite strict restrictions imposed on bars and other gathering places. LA Director of Public Health, Barbara Ferrer, announced that the alarming numbers require the government to take immediate action. And we've reached the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesterenglish.net. And we're on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telster English, I'm Camila Escalante. Thank you for watching.